Without further ado, I'm going to introduce Rachel Keyes, who is a school psychologist. She currently works for the Northwest Regional Education Service District. And over the past 20 years, she's worked to improve literacy outcomes in Oregon and nationally. She's taught courses on reading instruction at Portland State, worked as the literacy coordinator for the Tiger Two Alton School District, and supported schools in Oregon as part of the Reading First Initiative, as well as tutored individual students during the pandemic. Rachel believes strongly in the power of effective instruction to help all children read. And thank you so much, Rachel, yeah, for being here you're tonight. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here in person and on Zoom. Um, I'm excited to have everyone um, joining me, whether it's virtually or in person. And um, I am so happy to give back to Cedar Mill Library. I've raised my kids in this community and have enjoyed story times here and many great programs that have helped me. So I'm happy to be part of that, that program supporting our community. Um, so tonight we're gonna talk about, this is focused on um, children kindergarten through third grade. There will be some resources that are applicable to grades outside of those ranges, but we're gonna focus mostly on that area. And, um, I think one, um, oh, I wanted to mention, I do work for the Northwest Regional ESD now, but you can see on the slides, um, the materials I'm using are from, uh, most of them are from the National Center on Improving Literacy. And I just finished working um, for that center for two years and wanted to give them credit for this, um, this tutorial. So, um, let me see. I am a parent also, I'm passionate about helping kids to read in schools and also my own kids at home. And these were pictures of my own kids. Um, Brandon, who went, but they both went to a child's way preschool just right across the street and had great support in their literacy development. We did lots of literacy related activities at home. Obviously with my background, I kind of did things just on the go really um, that helped them a lot. And um, they generally had a, had a very easy time of learning to read, but that's not how it is for all many kids. So I just want to put that out there that it's not, um, learning to read is not like learning to speak. It's not inherently wired in, in our brains and it really needs to be taught. And so different kids need different levels of how much teaching they need. Um, okay, so this tutorial, the slides that I'm going to use are from this, um, from the National Center on Improving Literacy, and you can get more information on this link. It will bring you to the, um, let me see, to the website here. I'm just going to show you for those that are online, and then you can see it here also. So the slides that I'm presenting are also here as part of a tutorial, an online tutorial that you just click here and it will be narrated if you want to see it again or if you want to share the materials with anybody. This, like I said, it's a federally funded center. These materials are completely free and it's a very extensive website. I'm going to share a few of the infographics but there's lots of materials on supporting kids who have been diagnosed with dyslexia, how to advocate for your child, ways to work with your school and supporting your student, and fun things for kids to do. There's a kid zone, areas that they can enjoy, online books. So I, I encourage you to um, explore this website. Um, okay. So what we're going to do today is, um, there are uh, supporting materials that people here who are in person have. Um, if you look in your packet, you'll see that towards the back, there's uh, goals by grade level, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. It's kind of at the back of the packet. And in each of these areas, in books and print, the alphabet, sounds and spoken language, phonics, and, and down all of these categories. So if your child, and like I said, all of these for on, online participants, these materials will be posted. But basically what it is, is there's just a, a list of um, goals that are ideally met by the end of each grade. So you can look by the end of kindergarten, what are we wanting to do in all of these areas? What, what are the goals for kids to reach at the end of first grade, second grade, third grade? So that's a, a good resource to have. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that um, tonight also. So some of the infographics I wanted to share are about, um, the first one is on the science of reading. Um, this is also from the National Center on Improving Literacy. And um, 
the science of reading obviously has been very um, much in the news and um, this infographic really helps to explain what it is and what it is not. And so what the science of reading, when you have any, have you heard the term science of reading before? Any of you here or, oh, I forgot to say also, feel free to drop any questions in the chat. And also um, after I do the infographic, we'll see who's here too. So um, the science of reading basically mean is um, a collection of research over time in multiple fields of study that have been used to confirm how children learn how to read, what's the most effective way of teaching reading. It's based on these five big ideas, which are phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. It does encompass all five. It does encompass vocabulary and language development and um, comprehension. It's not solely focused on phonics, which I think is a common misconception. And it's ever evolving. There's new research being done all the time. What it is not is it's not a program or intervention that you can buy. Um, many reading materials or programs that are out there to teach children how to read might have science of reading on the cover. It's become very pop popular with publishers to just claim that they're based on the science of reading, but it really does take um, kind of an expert or guidance to know like, is this truly material that is um, that is based in the science of reading. So it's complete, uh, it's not complete. There's always more studies being done. We're always learning more things and evolving our knowledge. And it's not a phonics-based program that is just drilling um, only phonics. So um, the other, oops, the other um, infographics I was gonna share are the simple view of reading. And again, these are all on the Ensel website. Um, this simple view of reading is a helpful framework just to understand how the different pieces of reading come together. How when a student reads or a child reads a word, how um, being accurate and fluent in reading really impacts whether they can gain meaning from what they're reading, which obviously the goal is to gain meaning, right? So this example is just showing this sentence, a little dog barked at the big cat. And the first example is showing a student or child who sees each letter, but it does not know what the sounds represent, right? So they can't, they can't decode what's on the page. They, they don't have the sight words in their sight word bank. They don't have the skills to sound out words that can be sounded out. And um, the second example here is a, an example of a student who might know some of the words and really struggle to identify the sound. So it might sound like this if the child was reading. The, u, i, t, u, d, a, g, b, r, k, ed, at, b, b, i, g, k, at. So you can see how the reading is at that stunted level where they're not fluent and they don't have the decoding skills, it's much harder to gain any meaning from what you're reading, right? You can't, rec you recognize each word, but not the overall meaning of the sentence. And the last example is showing a student who's fluent in reading, the little dog barked at the big cat. Then you can gain, fully grasp the meaning of the sentence. So um, the last infographic I wanted to share is just also about, this is from Insul, is about um, advocating for your, about your child's reading development. And I mentioned this earlier, but um, this is just a good reminder. It's showing that um, if there's a mismatch between instruction and need, then that's often when students struggle. So just advocating for getting instruction intervention as early as possible and advocating early. I really encourage if there's one thing that you learn tonight is to not wait. There's definitely assessments that um, can be done as early as kindergarten to know if kids are on track or not. And it's important to get the help that you need right away. Waiting, having people tell you, wait, we need to wait and see if they'll catch up by third grade. The science and all the research is showing that that is not what needs to be happening right now. What needs to be happening is kids getting the appropriate instruction as early as possible. So I encourage you to advocate early, as early as you can. If you suspect that your child is behind, you have concerns to trust that and to know that, um, that getting help earlier is a much more efficient, much 
it's a much better trajectory for kids. If we wait and then they're developing bad habits, they're getting more discouraged with reading, um, that is not a trajectory that we want our kids on. So this infographic is just also reminding you to speak up if you have concerns, to share if there's a family history of reading difficulties, um, there is a genetic component to dyslexia that can be passed down. It is a brain-based, um, uh, brain-based, uh, you know, disorder or uh, a difference in the brain that can be passed down from generation to generation. Even with that difference in the brain, there are many effective ways of teaching kids to read who have been diagnosed with dyslexia. So um, I'm going to continue here and. Okay, so before I move on to my learning objectives, I'm going to back up a little bit, and I just wanted um, those of you in chat to um, just put what grade level your student is in, if you want to share. Um, I'd like to know who's here and um, what grade levels um, to focus on more and what you're interested in learning about. So, um, and if anyone here, if you want to share, I don't know if you have, what grade level is your child? Second grade, okay. So we have second grade here, and um, I assume in, on the chat. Kindergarten. In kindergarten, okay. Preschool. Oh, a preschool also, great. Okay. Another kindergarten. And, okay, another kindergarten. Great, so um, what our learning objectives, to the, and also feel free to put any questions, or if there's something that you want me to clarify a little bit further, please. Stop me and let me know, put in the chat. I'm happy to, to um, explain or to make sure that you're getting your questions answered. Um, this is really for your, for your benefit. So, okay, so our objectives are to learn um, evidence-based strategies to help with um, developing interest in and engagement with reading, developing listening and reading comprehension skills, um, recognizing speech sounds, and also um, children's word identification and oral reading skills. So we want to learn how to interact with children in ways that support their language and literacy development. Okay, so four key ways that we can think about this. We can think about how to support your child's literacy development and listen by listening, looking, helping, and encouraging. So when we listen, we're going to know which sounds and which letters, words, or ideas seem hard for your child and what, what he or she sounds like when reading aloud. So um, I can't encourage this enough as soon as, as um, with appropriate materials, and we're gonna talk about how to identify appropriate materials, but it's the, one of the best things you can do is listen to your child read out loud. Um, even if they're resistant to reading out loud, um, even if you just read for five minutes, um, a few times a week, having students, having your child read out loud will really um, give you a, a better, um, read on how they're doing in their reading development. If you never hear them read out loud independently on their own, then you never really have a true idea of where their skills are. So um, you wanna watch for skills or tasks that appear difficult. Um, maybe reading fluently is easy for your child, but if you ask a question about what happened or what was the name of the character in the story, um, they might not remember the name of the character. So just looking at what skills appear difficult. And then um, pause and give, giving your child a chance to correct mistakes is important. And giving a hint or prompting to figure out is also giving support and help is important. So, and encouraging, obviously, talk with your child about the book or activity. Okay, so the first one we're going to do is reading with your child. This helps your child to learn new words and ideas, understand the purposes for reading and also get to hear what reading sounds like. So when you read with your child, and we're gonna talk about specific ways you can do this, that they can hear you read and then you hear them read, um, it's important for them to, to know what fluent reading sounds like, what, what is it um, that they're really working towards. And we want them obviously to enjoy reading um, as much as possible. And when they're successful at something, obviously it's a lot more enjoyable. So reading with your child means that you, uh, you're, you and your child read and talk um, together and it's interactive. And you can read pictures, words, or use audiobooks. So you can listen to audiobooks together in the car. Um, you know, if you we listen to audiobooks a lot with my 
my children and sometimes I'm paying attention to the audiobook and sometimes I'm not. But if you're going to try to have a conversation about it, you know, then I choose to prioritize that as this is time when I'm going to actually listen to the audiobook with my child and, and have a conversation afterwards because those listening comprehension skills are really important also. And that's a really important way if kids are struggling um, to read independently, they can work on listen, the listening comprehension. You can read and talk in the language you and your child feel most comfortable. So if English is not the first language at home, you have books in the language that you're um, that your family speaks at home or that's the first language, you can use those materials to develop reading um, in that language also. And both reading both fiction and informational books. So a variety of books is important. Okay, so if you getting ready to read, if you're going to read a book together, you find a quiet, cozy spot so you both can listen and talk. And, um, and this doesn't have to be a lot of time. I know in this experience with my own kids, I might even you know, tell my son, we're gonna do this for 15 minutes or we're gonna do this for 10 minutes. It's not something that, oh, we have to find an hour to really work on reading. Oftentimes that's, that's too long. And especially if they're struggling, it feels overwhelming. So keep it short, you know, 10, 15, 30 minutes. Uh, let your child choose a book and pick one that matches his or her interests. And it can be slightly harder than what they can read on their own. And we want to chat, follow their lead and keep it fun. So choosing a book is um, a tricky, tricky piece that I know librarians here get questions all the time. How do I pick a book that's appropriate for my child? And I wanted to give some examples. Um, there are a variety of books in the library, obviously. There's the Bob books. I think some of you have seen these before. And I'm giving kind of two ends of the spectrum. There's the Bob books, and then there are more, um, you know, rich literature with a storyline and beautiful artwork and, and pictures. And both of these books, these types of books are important. They both serve different purposes. So we want to be reading both of them. Um, the decodable Bob books are all part of a group of books that's called decodable books. Some of the decodable books can also look like this, this book, Six Kits, um, or The Sound of Shh. So these types of books are books that students are generally gonna be more successful reading on their own. Um, they're gonna have the skills uh, to sound out each word. The words are more controlled. There aren't a lot of words with sounds that the kids have not been taught yet. So that's why it's called decodable. They're um, able to sound out the words. So this sentence here, six red kits sat on the log. So there's really only one, the word the would be a sight word. Otherwise, the majority of the words can be sounded out if the kids know the sounds of the words. So um, otherwise, there's, um, uh, this type of book is going to be more for like vocabulary development or as talking about reading comprehension, listening comprehension, but these types of books are going to have a lot more words that may not be as controlled as the decodable books. So are there any questions or anything so far? No questions. Not yet? Okay. I'll, I'll point out that I, it looks like we have primarily preschool and kindergarten of people here here with oh okay kids. around so that age the okay ones except for got it yes in second grade okay great so preschool and kindergarten so um the other piece that i wanted to just bring attention to are um the the uh, another type of book is is um our like guided level reading guided level reader book where there's more pattern there's more repetition and there's less focus on sounding out words so these types of books are good for also vocabulary development, but they're not the best for getting kids practice in sounding out words. So this book, Fast and Slow, um, a cat can be fast, a cat can be slow, a child can be fast, a child can be slow. So you see how there's a repetition and a pattern where you, if I don't really know the words on the page, I can use the pictures and I can use the pattern to figure out what the words are. And that strategy is not one that we that is helpful to um, develop in kids because what happens is, although they might feel successful with this story at this time, 
there's going to be a point, especially once they get into third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, when there's multisyllabic words that they need to have a decoding strategy to sound out, they're not going to have that strategy developed. So again, we use all the books for different purposes. It doesn't mean you never read the books of patterns, but you don't want to only read those. We would, we would mix it up and use all the different types of books. So um, let's see. Okay, so when, we're, when you're reading, you want to ask questions about, um, to help your child understand what she reads, she or he reads. Ask questions that your child can answer with more than one or two words. Ask questions that have your child use information from the story. Asking who, um, what, when, where, why, and asking questions about ideas in the book. So a variety of questions. And if you have um, a story or a, a fiction book, you can ask questions such as, why did the character do what he did? What, what else could she have done? Or what would, if you were in the story, what would you do? So relating it to your child and kind of getting their ideas of um, using their imagination and, and thinking about what they might do. So just having conversations about the um, about the the story. If there's informational text, informational material, why do birds fly south for the winter? What would happen if you planted a tree in the desert? Why is it important to recycle? So again, questions that just get the kids to engage with the text and to think about what they're reading about. Okay, so uh, again, there's more suggestions here. And again, all these slides will all be posted online. So if you wanna go back and look at when you're getting ready to read, what are some questions you can be asking? There's lots of different, um, different suggestions here. Making connections to, your, to the child's life to what your child knows and to ideas in the book. So we want to make connections and also um, making guesses or predictions about what might happen, what the, um, about what the story might be about and about why a character did something. So just different questions that are beyond, you know, what happened on the last page or, you know, kind of more, more um, interactive with the text. That's what we're really striving for. We had a question. Yes. Yeah. Pat. So, um, a parent asked, you know, where she can find decodable books. And we were answering that the, you know, we have our phonics section, which has decodable books. But I wondered if you wanted to address that question yeah. for, about how someone would find something that was decodable to their child. Right. That's a good question. So I would say for um, most this is starting... a second grader, by the way. Oh, it is a second grader. A second oh, grade, yeah. okay, great. Because I was going to say starting in kindergarten, um, ideally, I mean, depending on what program the school is using, but that might be something you could ask the teacher around, uh, do you have decodable books in the classroom? Are there any? Because oftentimes the core reading programs come with materials that can be like photocopied. So they're even like paper books that the kids can take home. Um, and those are often decodable materials. So I would say ask the teacher about decodable books and ask if they're used in the classroom and then if there's any that they can use at home. Um, and then the great you know, um, section that you have here, I would also recommend um, if, the, if there are materials being sent home from school that are decodable, you can look at those books and see, well, are, is, are they focusing on CH, on the digraph CH that says ch, like in cheese? Or what, what, is the, what is the focus of the book that's being sent home from school? And then you could come to the library and try to get more books that are focused on that same skill. So it's trying to reduce the, the skills that you're working on and giving lots of opportunities for kids to practice those skills in different books and um, different, um, different things that, that would keep their interest too, right? Because we want to keep them interested in that. So, okay. okay. Yeah, and then the question. Yeah. Uh, well, there's one other question. Um, a three-year-old um, who has suspected autism um, and has begun reading sight words, um, and they're wondering if they should work on letter sounds or increasing sight word identification or phonics for both for a three-year-old. Oh, okay. So for three-year-old, so this preschool, I would say um, it, for all kids. All kids are going to need to learn both sight words and letter sounds and having the skill of blending. So I would say even a child who, if there is suspected 
autism. I mean, I know I, I would need to know more details about the child, but, um, but in general, we want to make sure, and there are programs that can sometimes, depending on the background of the child or what's going on, they may need more repetition to get the practice, to get the skill down for um, blending words, for identifying the sound. But um, in general, that is a skill that we're wanting to teach to all kids, no matter what background they're from or what um, delay they may have or any, any background like that. So thank you for the questions. And do you have any questions? No. Okay. Um, okay, so the next piece is, and with preschool, this is important also, especially, um, it's preschool and then kindergarten and first grade is learning how speech can be broken into parts that layer that lays the foundation um, for breaking down smaller sound parts in speech. So what we're what we're talking about here is really um, training kids ears to be able to hear different sounds. So these are things, especially when I talk about preschool, you can do even before you're learning at print, looking at print. You can do things like saying a sentence out loud and ask your child to count or tap the number of words in the sentence. So here's an example. Um, they could hold up a finger for each word. The boy ate two pieces of pizza. So they're identifying how many words are in each sentence. Um, your child says each word while counting or tapping them. So the idea is you're trying to get kids to tune up their ears to be able to hear where words start and end, and also um, try to try out um, breaking apart words and then breaking words into sounds. So it's kind of like you start at the biggest level, breaking the sentence into words, breaking words, uh, compound words apart, like this example here, is you put two words together to form a word. So if I put straw and berry together, what's the word? Strawberry. Right, so you can see how this is something you could do with a three-year-old or and beyond, or any any child really. Um, what what do you? So you give an example. If I put straw and berry together, I get strawberry. What do you get if you put book and shelf together? And then the child will say bookshelf. So um, this is just an example of again, tuning up the ears to hear different sounds. It's a, a, one of the five big ideas we talked about earlier with the science of reading. It, this one is phonemic awareness. And it's really important. And it's also a skill that is often lacking in kids who end up being di diagnosed with dyslexia. It's harder for some reason, the areas of the brain that um, focus on hearing specific sounds is, um, is something that needs to be developed more. They need more practice, they need more opportunities. Um, so here's an exa another example. You can also break words apart. What do you get if you take cow out of cowboy? What are you left with? You're left with boy. So um, you can do this at the word level, and then you can also do it at the um, at, at the sound level. Sorry, let me just scoot back one to this one. So at the sound level, um, I remember when my kids were in preschool, there were lots of fun songs that were kind of rhyming songs that would make, that you can um, manipulate sounds. So you say, I have the word sat. Um, if I take out the s and I replace it with a mm, what's the word? Mat. Okay, so that's manipulating the sounds, right? Um, and that piece is a really important piece to develop the how kids hear sounds. It's and then as kids get older, it'll translate to even their spelling skills. Because in order to spell a word, if my child asks me, how, how do I spell um, how do I spell down? I say, tell me the sounds you hear in down. D -ow -n. So then they need to know. What are the sounds? Down has three sounds, even though it has four letters, because the O-W together says ow. So I have D, I would, okay, what, what letter makes the D sound? I know I write a D. And then I need to know that O-W says ow, right? O-W, N, last sound for N. So you can see how this skill of breaking words into sounds is a really important one that impacts even spelling as kids get older. Okay. 
So we want to help. I mentioned this earlier, but the importance of sounding out words um, is a really critical one. And it's one that um, is where you really rely on those decodable books to practice this skill. You want to be able to read new words, recognize familiar words, and understand what's being read. And there's been lots and lots and lots of research on um, kids who can decode and are fluent that it really impacts comprehension, as we showed earlier with the simple, the, um, simple view of reading, that example of the cat and the dog and knowing, being able to read fluently and understanding what's being read. So here's an example of how you might help your child with sounding words out. Um, we want to sound out words smoothly and try to connect the sounds as much as we can. So for the first word, um, or here's an example with the word man. Um, if you're the adult, you can say, how does this word start? And you want the child to say the first sound. Mm, what's the next sound? Ah. What sound comes next? Mm. What happens when you put them together? Man. What's the word? Man. So you can hear there's a step-by-step -step process of having them sound it out. And you can say, you know, um, tell me the sounds, um, blend it and say it fast or what, however works for you and your child. But just this big idea that you want them to know that for many words in English language, obviously there are many sight words also, but for um, to become successful readers, the kids need to use this strategy first around sounding words out and, um, and becoming more fluent with this skill. Any other questions coming up? No, not yet. Okay, feel free to stop me or, yeah, yeah. There's one more one slide mentioned again. Familiarize words, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, how do they familiarize with words? And my kid, like, she learned one word, but I'll tell her the meaning. Yeah. But next thing, like, I mean, in some other uh, thing, if she reads again, she will ask me the, the meaning. So, yeah. how do I make her like familiarize with that that meaning of that word? Oh, the meaning to yeah. hold on to what the word means. What, the, what that means, yeah. Oh, okay. There. So if you're talking about the meaning of the words, we're really thinking about vocabulary development, developing her vocabulary bank. And what uh, important ways to develop vocabulary are um, to have to have her use the word. Like if you explain the, um, can you give it, think of an example of one of the words? So, despite, like she was asking, like she read the uh, yeah. There what is one word like despite? And despite. Then, what does despite mean? That's a hard yes. one. Yes, that's a hard one. Yeah. It's very hard. It's not surprising that it's not surprising. <laughs> so what does despite mean? I know I should have asked for example. So you have to give um like you know, we went to the beach despite the fact that it was raining. Mm -hmm. Right? So what does despite mean? Despite wow. means we go to the beach even though it's raining. Really cool. Even though, right. right? So I would give this example. Um, and then I would say, um, that is a very hard word. Nice. Yeah. Then uh, ideally you would try to have her use it in a sentence. Oh. But again, that's a hard word for a second grader to use in a sentence. Mm -hmm. But you would want the child to use the word on their own, like for them to come up with an idea. Like, can you think of another uh, sentence that we could use despite, okay. if it means even though? So she might say, well, I would like to have ice cream despite the fact that I didn't have my dinner. Or I don't know. You know, I don't know if, but but um, ideally more. have her use it when they use it and they come up with examples on their own. Um, and if it's if it's a word that's more like a like a noun or something more concrete, then they could like draw a picture of it or have a, you know, show them a picture. Mm -hmm. This is what, um, this is what sharp looks like, like a picture of a knife or something. And so then they might, if they have a visual representation of what the word is and then they use it in their own language, then it gets more reinforced. Yeah. So the more they can use the words is better. Um, but that's a good question. Um, okay. So, um, these, this is just getting back to talking about sounding out the words, and this basically is just giving you information about um, when kids sound out the words, and it does relate to what you're talking about, because we want to know if they, if they know the word or if they know the meaning of the word. When they sound out a word, if they have a bigger 
um, vocabulary bank, and this is where listening comprehension can come in, then when they sound out words, it's a word that they recognize because they have it in their oral vocabulary. If they don't have the word in their oral vocabulary when they sound it out, then they're not sure if that's a real word or not, right? So um, we want to make, we, if it's an unknown word, we have the child read it again and make sure that you join all the sounds to, together correctly and then discuss the word's meaning um, just to build up that vocabulary bank. Okay, and fluency is our next piece here. Um, it's the ability to read words, phrases, sentences, and stories correctly with enough speed and expression. And um, reading aloud frequently develops fluency. So another misconception that I want to make sure that um, I've had people with this misunderstanding that fluency is just about reading fast. And it's not just about reading fast. It also needs to include expression and accuracy. So um, some schools are, or there's lots of research and around using like a one minute timing to see um, how far can a student get in a passage for one minute. But when they read that one minute, it needs to be read with expression and with accuracy. It's not just you know speed reading and seeing how many words I can get in a minute. So fluency is um, reading aloud and hearing the fluent reading is important. And um, when reading aloud together, you can set a steady pace. You can slow down for difficult words and speed up when more comfortable. Um, make sure the book is the right for your child's reading ability. So again, if you're developing fluency, ideally you have a book like on one page that, I mean, obviously one page of this, <laughs> a Bob book is different than one page of this, but um, you, if, you're, if you're working on fluency, whatever the page is, you don't want the kids to be making more than like, you need help on more than five words or like three to five words. If they need help, reading if they're if they can't read accurately if they miss at five or more words then that text is too hard for them to be developing fluency so you want to get a book that's at their level where they can read accurately and also you want to show how when you read you read like you talk so you pay attention to punctuation and you um your voice goes up and goes down or you might speed up or slow down and giving that that piece of fluency is important also yeah. Uh, also, like it, it's applicable for the library. Also. Like when when we come, right? Like if if I want to understand like my child's level of reading, and then directly go uh, check those books. Like, is there any way that like, I I know like some code or like some something like that? Let's say like reading level two, reading level three. We well, usually, if you come into the library, we can help you look at a few books and uh -huh. maybe open the book and and ask your child to read a sentence. Okay. And see if they can read that comfortably. Um, and, and we can do that with you anytime. Okay, yeah. okay. But like, yeah. though I know like, oh, at that level, let's say if I, if I want to buy some books outside, right? Like, how do I know that? There's no precise level yeah, that okay. you can count on. Every okay. publisher has their own level. So it, yeah, you might In find that. In the school, a, they have like, they say, oh, some red level, green level, but I don't know what that means. But like, when I come to library, right, like, it's a different, I see. Yeah, different level. So I, I cannot manage both That's of them. guided reading level, and your yeah. teachers may be sending you to find those books, and we can help yeah. you find okay. those yes. also. And right. sometimes that's an sometimes that's an effective way to find a, okay. a readable book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We have a question. Okay. How is fluency related to stamina? How long should the read aloud be? Oh, okay. Good question. How is fluency related to stamina? So the read aloud being um i'm assuming what your child is reading out loud yes um i think well one thing I, when i hear the word stamina i always think of if um students are if it's easier to sound words out and i can move through the text with more ease then it's easier for me to read more of it right so if it's an easier text where I can have like high, high accuracy. I'm not coming to a lot of words that I don't know. I'm not coming to words that a lot of words that I need help with. Um, so the text is at a level where, um, where I can read, where I can read out loud um, with more ease that, that might help develop 
stamina, but I don't, there isn't really a time frame recommendation. We're going, let me get to the next slides because we're going to get to also some like partnering activities with parent and child that you can do to develop fluency. And that might help. Um, they're right here actually. So some things you can do when reading aloud together, and I've done these also with my kids, was especially if my it was mostly my son that was more resistant to reading than my daughter. But if I if it was feeling like um, you know he didn't really want to read out loud, you can take turns reading continuous pages of the book. So you know for reading this book together, I'll read um, I'll read the page you know one page and then he reads one page. Like I'll say okay I'm gonna read um, I'm gonna read the pages on this side. Or is it a type of Or you can just take turns because I guess obviously, like I might read this side and then you're going to read this side. And then we get to the next one. And then I'll read, it's just alternating pages, basically, alternating the pages and moving through the book in that way um, can help with, I think, developing stamina also. Um, and you can also read the same passage of the book allowed at the same time so you could read it kind of like choral reading like okay let's read this together um let's both read together ready go miss robinson's puppy chased after a duck so you're both reading at the same time so if they are coming to a word that they don't know they kind of hear you read it at the same time so that's another way to develop fluency and then you can read a passage of the book aloud and have the child read the same passage aloud so you could read this page and then they can read the same page again. So that also serves an important purpose um, for them to hear you read it, what your expression is like and what it sounds like when you read it. And then they kind of try to model that and, and read in the same way that they heard you read. So yeah, um, just to add one more thing, like we, we do like one more step there. So first I read and then I ask her to read and next thing, well, she reads something I, because when yes. I read, she'll remember what I'm reading. Yes. It's easy for her to read, I read that one. So next time I'll tell her that you read this one and then I'll, I'll read that. Yes, one. that's great to do. Yeah, that's a really good point that if you're always the one that's reading first, especially well, if it's a short part, they can kind of memorize well, and then they're not truly reading it. But yeah, so then taking turns and having the, the, um, the child go first too. So that's a good Good, uh, good addition. Okay, so let me see. We have our quiz at the end. I'm like, we're already, I have lots of resources to go over also and feel free, are there more questions? We'll chime in. Um, you'll chime in, okay. So this is our, our quiz at the end of our, um, of the section we went through so far. Here's an example of Jane. She has a, a child in fifth grade who's reading to learn in science and social studies. What could she do to support her child's word learning and understanding of new ideas. And these are things that we talked about, playing word games and talk about interesting or unfamiliar words, read with her child, and ask questions before, during, and after, or all of the above. And last, last, last one, right. So all of the above would be the answer here. Um, let me see. Oh, I guess it's supposed to highlight, but. Um, okay, so um, we have resources here. Um, that I can go through. I guess I do have time. Are there more questions? I kind of anything else that I don't see. I don't see. Oh, um, someone says they got advice that reading the same book over and over again builds fluency. Is this correct? Um, I suppose if they don't memorize it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. If they don't memorize it, I think. Um, yeah, and that was one of the examples that I gave was. Well, reading, I don't, I'm trying to think of that would count as, um, you're just having the child, the child read it over and over. Is that what it sounds like? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess it would depend on the, on the age of the child, but repeated readings do help with building fluency. Mm -hmm. So, um, within reason, I mean, you can read the same uh, few pages over and over um especially for very beginning it's yes for very beginning so if you do read i know it's hard for me not to have a full context of the question mm -hmm. but but yes repeated readings are definitely one way 
that and and a lot of the, one of the intervention programs that I was helping in a school yesterday that they use and part of the program is re repeated reading of passages the students read it and then or, or they read it with the teacher then they read it on their own and then they read it on their own with a timing um, so there's multiple ways to to read it you know to try to keep it fun also so you can reread the same story but I think what what you, I think maybe what you're referencing, uh, Jenny, is like if kids, especially really young, like three or four, if they've kind of memorized a book and they're just rereading it all over, um, if it's just memorizing the book, that's not like truly reading it. It's no, it's truly it's a sounding stage it out. in learning to read, but it is yes. not reading yet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I guess that's there's a difference between memorizing a book and just reading, reciting the book over and over is different than actually reading and for fluency in a repeated way. So I do see uh, there's another question about um, my son is in preschool. He is not reading at all yet. And I'd like you to address that. Mm -hmm. I think I feel like we have people with preschool age yeah. children and expecting them to be reading. And I, I think that oh, we yeah. can clarify that you don't need to be reading yet in preschool. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, um, that's a good clarification. But she does say um, he likes me reading him books mm -hmm. so that's very appropriate um, yes of late he has started liking long chapter books is that okay to do in parallel with decodable books for him to start reading or should i stick to decodable books oh yeah oh yeah so for pre for preschool i would definitely say that's more of the age where you're um there's more of being books being read to the child, you're building, vocabulary. you're building vocabulary, you're building listening comprehension. So yes, 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 keep up with the chapter books and um, other books that they that they enjoy. Picture, picture books. Picture books. Yeah. Oh, sorry, they said picture books. Well, she said chapter books too, but really yeah. picture books are great for preschool, right? Yes, picture yeah, books yeah. But also books. if they wanted to listen, I mean, picture books are bad, uh, yeah, really best for preschool, but also if um, if they are reading like a chapter book where he's just, he or she is listening to the story, right? That's also appropriate um, for preschool. But yeah, I, I mean, it's not not at all expected that but in preschool you're reading. It is, I think the things that we do look for in preschool, or I know the things we look for in preschool are the phonemic awareness. So being able to hear, like doing more activities, like tell me the first sound you hear in the word run. And what's the first sound? Um, or tell me which words rhyme. Which of these words rhyme? Run, sun, mat. Which are the two that rhyme? So those types of activities where you're building that phonemic awareness um, is really important in preschool years. Right. And we do that in story time all the time, right? Yes. We sing songs and we do rhymes and that helps build that skill mm -hmm. um we have and you a, can start with with some letter song correspondence is fine too sure. like practicing what sounds the letters make and mm -hmm. um blending a few sounds together um, yeah, if those are coming way, yeah. easy in a fun way um i think i showed the picture of my daughter where we had the letter cards like on the floor and or we used to do like the letter um those foam letters in the bathtub where you can just put the letter, you know, and, and review what's the sound? Oh, this is T. What sound? T? You know, and it was fun for the kids in the bathtub or using shaving cream or whatever is fun. Um, but it's not not an expectation and by any means that all kids are going to kindergarten reading. Right. So if I understand correctly, you're saying it's be playful with language and by all means teach children the letter sounds, but we don't need to sit down and do reading practice where we're actually trying to decode like you don't yeah. need to be reading Bob books in preschool, right? But, but definitely playing with sounds. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, playing with sounds. I think. I mean, if. I mean, I don't want to say they absolutely shouldn't be using oh, Bob books, but you know what I mean. Yeah. If if kids are interested and they want to, and um, yeah, and they're and they're feeling successful and they want to practice sounding out words, we don't want you know the earlier kids can get on that train the better but it's not and we don't want to turn it into a power struggle or turn kids off of the having the love of reading because they're having to do like flashcards or something when they're three years old like yeah uh, and there's another question so uh, this person has a child in kindergarten 
And it says, we've been asked to help our kids memorize a list of sight words in kindergarten. Is this okay as long as it's being combined with practice decoding? Um, yeah, I would, that's a hard question. Depends on the sight word list, right? Some of those sight word lists are yes. um, decodable words. Yes, I would say it depends on the sight word list and um, how many words are on the list. Um, so I guess what I would say is, in, and this is kindergarten. Yeah. Yeah. So for kindergarten, we really do want to um, be focusing on phonemic awareness. Like I said, the sound, hearing sounds and words, we want to be focusing on blending sounds. So the decoding also, and the hard part about sight words um, is that different programs use the term sight words to mean different things. Because in kindergarten, there's gonna be a lot of words like the word, um, let me think of it, um, shut. If I don't know that SH says shh, then that may be taught as a sight word because I, don't, I haven't learned that diagraph yet. But once I learn that SH says shh, and that will come more like in first grade or um, maybe late kindergarten, but depends on the program then that word shut is no longer a sight word. And it's no longer a word that I need to take up memory in my, my memorization part of my brain. I don't need to take up, if I have a, a, a certain amount of memorization area in my brain, I don't wanna be filling it with words that I, I will eventually be able to decode once I have those skills. Yeah. So the words that, there are some words in the English language that are always sight words, they'll never be decodable. The word the is always a sight word. The word people was, there are certain words that no matter which phonetic elements you learn, they're always gonna be a sight word. So I wanna reserve that special part of my brain where I need to have, where I need to be able to access those words by sight for those types of words. So, and I, I know that's a hard answer because it, it's what you're getting from the school. So, um, but it's, it's kind of what the research is showing. So I just want to share that. Another question. Do you or the science of reading research uh, support the use of reading records for reading assessment? If not, what is the alternative? Oh yeah, running records. Does it say reading records? Reading records. But I'm not sure. What well, I think I've heard, I know that, um, in my work in the schools, like many, many years ago, I, there were running records, which were part of a, um, yeah, a part of an extensive assessment that, and I don't know if this is, is there a grade level for this one? No. No. But I think what the science of reading would support, um, not necessarily using running records, but the majority of the research has been done on oral reading fluency, which is looking at, um, how many words are read in a minute and what the accuracy is and what the expression is of the words that are read in a minute. Yeah, she um, said clarifying it's running records. Yeah. And I believe she might have a preschooler. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I think to answer, yeah, no, the science of reading is would not, in, in my experience of the research and what we've recommended and what we've seen as most useful for identifying for for quickly assessing students and um, identifying the appropriate intervention is um, in not using running records, but using an oral reading fluency measure, which again, there's different, a lot of different assessment systems that Dibbles all use. Or... Dibbles uses oral reading fluency measure. And now there's a platform, it's Acadians is the overarching, um, is a platform now that houses Dibbles. So there's lots of different names for the assessment, but basically if you talk to the teacher or if you ask what the assessment is, um, the, the, most, the, most, the most bang for your buck is really the one minute timing, the one minute oral reading fluency where you're looking at a grade level passage. If your child's in first grade, there's readability levels that are done on certain passages. And then, you know, this is a first grade passage and I know that my child read 35 words in a minute on this first grade passage. 
And of those 35 words, um, he or she got um, 33 accurate, right? Because you can read 35 word, get you could get to the 35th word in a passage and you can make 10 errors, or you could get to the 35th word in a passage and make two errors. And that's very different um, accuracy levels, which obviously impacts comprehension greatly. If you're missing key content words and you're making mistakes on those words, then you're really gonna impact your comprehension. So that's where the accuracy really comes as an important piece. Um, other questions or I can um, just quickly share some of the resources. I'll, um, when, you're, when you get these or post online, these all have the links, but I would really encourage you, this first one is, um, called is sold a story which is a podcast series um from emily hanford and i don't know if some of you may have heard of this series but it's just a um it's audio uh, it's a podcast and it's a really powerful documentary that she has put out around um, how reading has been taught in the United States in different areas and why um, so many students in the United States unfortunately are not meeting um, grade level goals and how um, the way that different programs teach kids how to read is a really big part of that problem. So um, it's just very powerful. There's parents who have told their own story of their kids being in certain schools and getting different approaches. And so this is a really great one to become more familiar with the science of reading. Um, and I will, yeah, so, and then the, the Right to Read movie um, is one that you can go to this website and I know they're having different viewings. I think it was shown in, um, like near in Wilsonville a few weeks ago and then in Northeast Portland. And so it's a, it's a, a story. It's just a, a really powerful documentary again about um, this man was a it was about Oakland, California and how they made changes in terms of getting kids on track. And it's a really, I'm, have you heard of any new? I heard of it, but I haven't seen it yet. So. I know, I was thinking I would love it if you guys did a viewing. That would right. be an awesome event. Um, to offer that as a viewing of that movie. Yeah, and I love to tell the story that was yeah. shocking. Yeah. And then there's more around questions you can ask your school and other podcasts um, to listen to, to learn more about the science of reading. And then Scarborough's Reading Rope is an important piece just to get an idea of how the science of reading um, really integrates all different pieces with phonics and vocabulary and comprehension. And um, all of these are, are really great resources that you can and you have time, I would highly recommend them. So um, are there more, we have time for a few more questions or? Are they lengthy questions? Yeah, it looks like we're doing okay. There okay. were a few questions about book lists that okay. Rebecca answered. Oh, good. Thank you for your help with the chat. What's so do you have any more yeah. here? No, okay. Oh, there's one question. Well, that, yeah. What's the four questions? What, oh, what was here? That to? Was that, did you have four, oh, questions, four questions? Yes. There we to go. ask your child's teacher. So this is, um, I need to share again here, right? So this is also from a podcast, I think, or from Redwood Literacy. Is it not showing here? There, it takes a minute. Um, so these are questions that you can ask. I know that conferences may be coming up soon, so these might be timely. Um, how much time is spent, oh, this is really small. How much time is spent on foundational elements of reading? They're right here. Um, has the teacher screened the class on reading skills? And if so, can they share the results of the assessment? Because obviously as the parent, you're entitled to the results of those assessments. Um, what reading opportunities are there for reading different types of texts within a range of text levels? And then what can I do at home? So this is um, this is from the Redwood Literacy, which has, this is just one piece of, of it has all a whole bunch of resources for parents around science of reading and ways to advocate for your children, navigating the diagnosis process. It's a really extensive um, blog that has lots of resources. So. So. Yeah, lots of lots of resources and reach out with questions. I did put I do have my um, contact information 
on the last slide. So feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can email or call or text, and I'm happy to answer any more questions that you might have. And um, it's really important to keep kids reading and keep them on track as early as possible, um, just to avoid problems developing in the future. We'll get them on track early. That's basically the main message is um, we want to keep keep kids on track and, and try to avoid the, the cycle of the frustration and the difficulties developing and not going addressed, not getting addressed. So I hope you got some tools that can help you address those things and I'm glad to be here and share and um, that's about it. Are there any other questions, Rebecca, or should we? Uh, people are just saying great information. Oh, Thank okay. you. <laughs> More thank yous. Thank you so much. Great. And hopefully we can have you back sometime, Rachel, because this yes. is really good information to have. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great.